My name is Stephanie Pampas, and I'm the STEM Cats Peer Mentor. Thank you so much for coming to STEM Talks tonight. We have a great group of mentors ready to talk about their experiences with you guys. So sit back and enjoy, and thank you again for coming. The first presenter is Maria. really glad that I'm here now because I was alone for a while. Um, so, oh, um, I'm not really nice. Sorry, one second. So, um, this past spring break, I went on a health brigade with Shoulder to Shoulder through Education Abroad. And uh, the purpose of this brigade was to offer free uh, clinical health and um, interdisciplinary care in Santo Domingo in Ecuador. So uh, my biggest thing with being in college was that I wanted to make a significant impact and a direct impact. Um, and I didn't really know how to do that. And I heard of a lot of people doing volunteering abroad. So I went to a first step session with education abroad where I kind of just sat down and talked to somebody about what my interests were. And they gave, came back with a list of programs that might be interesting to me. And this was one of the programs on there. Um, for the program, I had to take a one where they taught us the purpose of inter interdisciplinary care and how um, on this brigade we were going to have, we had PT, we had dentistry, we had um, gynecology, um, we had optometry, and we had a bunch of other disciplines that were all working together in one clinic, which was because a lot of the people where we were working would never really get a chance to see these, um, these different professions. So the main goal was to get these people as much care as possible. Um, my favorite part of it was that because I do speak Spanish, I was able to translate and kind of get a really good uh, hands-on and per first-person point of view into this. Um, I had done a lot of shadowing before, but this was kind of different because I was able to make a direct impact with the patient and I, it sounds bad, but like without me, they wouldn't have been getting the same care as if they were just trying to talk to somebody in two different languages. Um, we did a lot, they taught me a lot of um, hands-on stuff, like I learned how to take blood pressure, and uh, I got to see a lot of cool things that I never really would have seen uh, shadowing here. We saw a lot of pterygiums, which uh, happen when you're working in the sun a lot. You would develop a little cloud over your eye, so a lot of that was present. Uh, we saw a lot of tinea, which is also just like sunspots that, uh, that are caused by funguses. And it was really cool because these are things that I would never have seen and a lot of uh, social distributions of health that just aren't really present in America. There was a lot of iron deficiencies, anemia. One of the biggest things that we did was um, teaching kids how to brush their teeth because just no one really focuses on that. The trip brought like 2,000 toothbrushes and 2,000 tubes of toothpaste to hand out. So it was really interesting. A lot of people had been on the brigade before, um, got to see kids that they had met a year ago and continued to teach them how to work with. Um, this picture here is us uh, with the Satchela tribe. We went to a tribe called Labua and kind of just set up in, on a dirt path and gave medical care there, which was really difficult because a lot of these people had time that um, had problems that we weren't able to correctly diagnose right away, so we had to like refer them to come back to see us the next day at the clinic. And I think um, so. Here's a picture of me translating with somebody, and it was really cool because the girl in the blue, she is a PA student here at UK, and the gentleman in the other blue, um, he's a medical resident here at UK, so we got a lot of uh, cross paths. One day there was a vet who, she was just a translator also, and so she was able to come, and they never actually had a vet come, and there were a lot of dogs for me around, so she did some checkups on them too. Um, I think that this was a really important thing for me to be able to do because it made me feel like I was 
giving a good impact and doing what I felt that I needed to do with my time. Um, and I met a lot of really incredible people that, because um, the university there sent about 20 of their med students to come work with us. And I just felt like, this is really fresh on my mind, so I felt like I really got to meet a lot of people and make a lot of differences. Um, a lot of kids would like draw us pictures, and I came home with like a backpack full of pictures from kids. And it just made me feel like I was doing a really good service, which is what I want to do with the rest of my life. Um, if anybody is interested, they do have first step sessions uh, with Education Abroad every uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And you can also email Education Abroad. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Okay, so my name is Haley Dickin. I am biology and neuroscience junior um, from Jamestown, Kentucky, and I'm, of course, a STEM CATS peer mentor. Uh, I'm really excited to tell you guys about this organization today because it involves two of my main interests, one being community service and the other being traveling. So Alternative Service Breaks is a unique organization that allows undergraduate and graduate students the opportunity to do service abroad, um, and as well as domestically. And it focuses on a variety of different social issues. So in my case, I focused on global youth empowerment because that's something very interesting to me. I want to one day work in pediatrics um, and I'm very focused on children's welfare as well as education. And so it's something that is very close to my heart, but you can focus on different issues, a plethora of different issues from LGBTQ plus issues, immigration, activism, domestic violence, hunger and homelessness, really anything that you're interested in involving service, you can find a trip that revolves around that. So as I mentioned, my trip was about global youth empowerment, and I actually went abroad to Monte Cristi, Dominican Republic. However, before I even thought about going on this trip, we had what are called pre-connects, which are meetings leading in the weeks and months leading up to the trip that allowed us to get prepared for the service that we're about to do and learn more about the social issue as well as familiarize ourselves with the community. And I found this to be very impactful and meaningful when I actually got there because I already had a good understanding of the situation that I was going to be put into and how I could make the biggest impact. So when I actually got to the Dominican Republic, I worked in a learning center through the organization Outreach 360. Uh, we taught kids there English, math, and Spanish literacy. And we learned not only a lot about the education system, but about the culture of the Dominican Republic and its relationship with Haiti and the United States. And I got a lot more out of it than I really thought I would. I thought I would just be going there to do service and learning about the social issue, but I actually ended up learning a lot about a country that I had not too much of an idea about. So, um, in my trip, we taught the kids through the week in a summer camp type setting. Um, well, it was their winter break, so it was kind of like a camp setting. And this was really a supplement to their education that they got there. One thing that we learned about their education system is in the Dominican Republic, it's one of the lowest ranked education systems in the world. So the service that we were doing was really meaningful and impactful to that community. And you could see it in the children that came to the learning center really passionate to learn and wanted to point out things and ask what they were in English and learn everything that they could while they were there. And that was really awesome to see. And on the last day that we were there, we went on a cultural excursion, which was really interesting because it was kind of unexpected for me. I thought we would really be just there for service, as I mentioned, but we ended up going to the Haiti Dominican border and learning a lot about the relationship there and really the idea of um, meaningful service and not just um, giving without asking, but asking the people what they really need and how impactful that can be. And so I really enjoyed my trip. Um, and if you have any questions about this trip or others, you can talk to me after. But you can also get involved uh, through their website, ukasb.org. It shows all the different trips and the social issues that they cover. And you can also email the program director and it's all in your flyer. Thank you. And the next speaker is going to be Karen. <laughs> Hi, my name is Karen.
Karen Mogumba. I am going to talk to you guys about uh, Summer Health Professional Program, but I'm going to call it a SHPEP because that's how we call it because it's just so long to say. So I am from Louisville, Kentucky. I'm majoring in neuroscience, minoring in biology, and the pre-med track. And how I found out about this program was through Philippus Felicinelli, the pre-health advisor here at UK. I was, like during my freshman year, I was like, I want to do something for the summer. I was like, I don't want to just stay home and do nothing. So I went up to her and she told me about this program. And I signed up for it, I got in it, and um, it's a six weeks uh, long program. And basically, for the whole six weeks, you're taking science courses such as biochem, anatomy and physiology, um, yes. And also, uh, we have workshops during, that, um, during the six weeks, and we talk to any students who are like pre-health providers, such as like pre-med students, pre-dental students, pre-pharmacy students, and we ask them, questions about how they got into their program and like how they got into medical school, like their pre-professional school. And um, my favorite part during the program was uh, the clinical experience. I got to shadow a doctor. So when we signed up for like what we want to shadow, uh, they asked me uh, what we want to shadow. And I was like, um, <clears throat> I wanted to do surgery, but I was like, if I did surgery, I would probably like faint walking into the surgery room. So I chose to like do an ER doctor, but people say ER is also a crazy place to be in. <laughs> so I was just like, Oh well, so like when I showed up in the ER doctor, uh, in the ER hospital, uh, when I walked in there, it was like a kid came in, teenager, had gunshots, three gunshots, and I was like, well, it's a crazy night to like uh, shadow, but it was very interesting in seeing how the doctors play, uh, played a big role and how the nurses and like everybody in the health field played a big role. So um, that was like the greatest experience. I also made a connection with the ER physician. I asked him questions about. Um, how he got into medical schools and how, do, how he got into medical school and like if I could shadow him again and he said I could shadow him so every time when I go back home to Louisville I just email him and then he says yeah you can just come in and shadow me but just not be too in the way so uh, if you guys have any questions about this program and like how my experience was I'm gonna ex answer on your, any of your questions thank you My name is Hiba. I'm a junior biology major on the pre-med track, and I'm going to be talking to you guys about an organization that's really helped me grow as a college student and as a member of my community. And that organization is Alpha Phi Omega, or APO. Um, so who here has heard about APO? Who here is a part of APO? Woo! <laughs> so APO is a national leader, national co-ed service fraternity based on fostering the three core principles of leadership, friendship, and service. And um, so coming to UK as an out-of-state freshman, um, I was really looking for organizations that would help me build relationships with, with my peers, help me build my leadership skills, and also help me um, connect to my community more, which was something I did a lot like with, um, during high school like through service. So finding all three of these things through an organization such as APO was kind of like hitting the jackpot, finding all three in one, and um, really motivating me to join. Um, so I first heard about this organization um, during K-Week of my freshman year. Um, uh, me and a couple of friends were walking around the Bowl of Philly Tea, and we saw a group of students playing kickball, and they were um, trying to get people to join. And so everyone that I talked to um, at that event was really kind, really welcoming, and they were really passionate about APO. And that kind of really struck me because I remember thinking, like, if everyone that I meet in college here is as friendly, as nice, and as passionate about service as these people, it's going to be an amazing four years. And so far it's been. Um, so um, I was really motivated to join, but I was kind of afraid of how well I'll be able to manage the commitment or the, like, my college workload that first semester and a commitment to this fraternity, which includes 20 service hours a semester, as well as um, five leadership events and five fellowship events, as well as other commitments as well. Um, so I decided to wait until my spring semester to join. And when I did, I fell in love with it, and I'm still in love with it. I love the people, I love the events, I love the passion that everyone has for serving and for just being there for each other and building themselves as leaders. Um, I love being a part of an organization that has such a diverse group of brothers. Um, 
they all have very different interests, different career goals, and I also love the volume and the multitude of different um, service events that we can participate in. Um, one of my favorite organizations that APO introduced me to is Sweet Blessings, which is a nonprofit organization that bakes and decorates cakes for, or birthday cakes for children that are living in poverty, um, living with terminal illnesses, or with special needs. And I, because of APO, I've been able to volunteer with them like regularly, and it's made me feel like I could really make a difference in my community, even if it's just by putting a smile on a kid's face or just decorating a cake, which is really cool. Um, so overall, APO has really helped me become a better friend, a better leader, and a better servant to my community. And if anyone here feels like this is something they'd like to be a part of, or if you're very passionate about service, um, I definitely recommend going to our website, which is on the slide, yes. And um, uh, looking at more um, about what we do and how we operate, and we also take new members um, during our rush season in the, the beginning of the fall and spring semesters. Um, so thank you for listening. And our next speaker is Davis. Hey, everyone, hear me okay? Cool. Hi, I'm Dave Collins. Um, I'm a sophomore biology student. Currently, I'm pre vet track. I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina, and I'm here to talk about pre vet advising. So, out of everyone here, kind of give me a hand if you're pre med right now or thinking about it. So, good to a lot of you. Any pre vets out there? No? That's okay. There will probably be a few of you after this who will be like, yes, I'm pre vet now. Because um, here are two big reasons why. First off, we don't have to take the MCAT. I think that's pretty awesome. Um, we actually take a uh, standardized test called the GRE. Um, I like to think of it as kind of like a big kid ACT almost. It's used for a lot of um, postgrad schools, and it's the one um, a lot of kid, um, a lot of colleges use. And the second reason is we get paid to be with animals all day long and just be with them. And I think that's awesome. Whether it's dogs or cats, or if you're bringing the horses and cows or even zoo. I mean, I think that's always pretty awesome. Um, so to kind of get it off, kick it off, um, I'm going to first talk about some of the things colleges look for, and then I'll talk about um, kind of some of the stuff about some colleges. Um, and again, I'm going to give you some basic stuff, if you guys are ever interested at all. Um, up there is Ms. Um, Claude Tabot. She's one of the pre-med uh, advisors here. She's great, awesome, super friendly. Um, she'll have a lot more details and have, we'll be able to answer a lot of specific questions you guys may have. So definitely feel free to email her there. So, um, so vet schools in general, like most post-grad um, schools, they look at um, GPA um, and some sort of service hours. What I mean by service hours is, it's not just necessarily, oh, I took care of my dog for my whole life. Accept me. That's just not how it works. They look for... Um, experience with actual doctors, so that's shadowing right under the doctor, or basically being in some sort of tech position where you're always with the doctor, seeing how they run their business and diagnose their patients. Um, in the bottom right picture there, that's me. I have a family member who's out of Texas. It was a vet. He recently retired. But that's me next to a 400-pound pig, which I thought was huge. I'm a city guy, so that was a pretty new experience. Um, and we were trimming its big old tusk right there. So, just like experience like that is great um, for any sort of application. Um, so, for vet schools, similar to yeah, this one, similar to undergrad, um, they look at in-state and out-of-state students. Um, here in Kentucky, there isn't a vet school. There's only about 30 in the nation, which seems small, but there are ways where you can make it less competitive. Um, so, like I said, since Kentucky doesn't have a vet school, they have contract seats with Auburn, where there's a certain preset number of seats specifically for Kentucky residents to apply to Auburn for vet school. And so, of course, Auburn will have their in-state students um, from people from Alabama, and then the rest will be out of state. Um, so if I'm from North Carolina, so just my personal example, NC State, which is that little dog statue on the left there, that's on their campus. Um, with most like with being my in-state school, um, just kind of give a ballpark example. Um, so they accept 100 people every year. 
Um, about 80 of those are usually reserved for in-state, and then those other 20 are for the rest of the people who apply. Um, so in a lot of cases, you may find yourself in those out-of-state positions, maybe a little bit more competitive, um, but don't worry about that. Uh, Ms. Collective Bell specifically, she's great at kind of helping you build a great profile and kind of keep you on the right track to ultimately do well in applying to that school. So again, if, um, oh, real quick, almost forgot. So that website there, I have aabmc.org. That's basically the vet school one-stop shop. Almost everything you need is right there. It's awesome. You can look at all the different pages for the vet schools. You can go straight to their website from there. They show like the GPAs, the tuition costs, and all sorts of other small details that may get overlooked just right there on that one website. It's awesome. I love it. I'm on it all the time. So if you all have any other kind of questions, um, feel free to seek me out afterwards. Um, or if you have any sort of specific, specific questions. And now we're like, yes, pre-med all the way, pre-med's not as cool. Definitely email her as well. Thank you all so much. And next we have sophomore here at the University of Kentucky, and I come from Bourbon, Illinois. It's quite a mouthful. So, to start off, I'm going to start off with a question. Who here has seen a military drama, be it a television show or a movie? So, you're right here in the front row. What is your first thought when you hear the word army? Uh, Saving Private Ryan. That's exactly correct. A lot of people <laughs> see the military in this dramatic Steven Spielberg kind of way as this band of brothers who go out and save the world from, you know, any sort of terrorist threat, foreign enemy. But, I'm here to tell you that the Army has much more to offer. The Army has something called the Reserve Officer Training Corps, and was I supposed to put my slide up? Oh, sorry about that. Alright, here you go. So, the University of Kentucky Army ROTC, or ROTC, as you may hear around Kentucky, is the Reserve Officer Training Corps, which is designated to develop future leaders. So what I do is that I basically dedicate four years of my undergraduate career pursuing a military science minor, it would be if I was not a Bachelor of Science, and then I commission as a second lieutenant. So. I know second lieutenant uh, rings zero bells in your ears because it didn't even ring a bell in my ears before I came here. Because honestly, I didn't even know about ROTC when I first came to the University of Kentucky. But I talked to Mr. Chester Allen Beck, who is up there, and he convinced me to start pursuing ROTC. Uh, convincing was kind of easy because I've always wanted to join the military. I don't know why, but my whole family has been a part of the military, and I just figured that doing my part and honoring my grandfathers and my fathers would ultimately make me a better man. And of course it has. So as you can see up there, I've had many experiences with an ROTC. As in the middle picture, you can see a ranger tab underneath, which actually goes to the guys who go through ranger school. I have not gone through ranger school because I'm not that cool. Um, but at the University of Kentucky, we have something called the Ranger Challenge. And so the Ranger Challenge is hosted at EKU, Moorhead, or the University of Kentucky. They rotate every year, and then if you beat all of the other ones, you get to go to Fort Knox, and you get to spend two days in the mud just doing Army stuff. So, what is Army stuff? Army stuff includes rucks, which is heavy backpacks, walking long distances. It sounds crazy, I know, right? But, you gotta do it. Another Army thing is this motto called Hurry Up and Wait which means you stand there and you wait for a long time. It's a lot of waiting within the Army. However, the Army also builds character because it develops leaders. That is the entire goal of the Reserve Officer Training Corps, and it's your duty as a platoon leader, as a second lieutenant, and basically as an American citizen. Anybody can be a leader. It really doesn't matter. But I'm here to tell you that ROTC is great, and I lost track of everything. So, anyway, 
That picture on the left, that's my uncle. He was in Marine Corps. He was in the Marine Corps, uh, served in the Gulf War, and that's my contracting day. So the way the ROTC works is that you get a contract, you sign a contract that specifies that you are dedicated to this program, and as I said before, you spend your four years undergraduate, you get full tuition, they pay for your housing, they pay for your meals, they even give you a stipend. It seems like a ridic ridiculous amount of money, but it's the Army, so I'll take all the money I can get. <laughs> And then after that, you can either serve in the active, guard, or reserve. So you serve however many years your contract is obligated to serve. Traditionally, it's two years for every one year that you're paid for. One year is active, and one year you can do in the guard or the reserves. So thank you for listening to me ramble about the ROTC program. I'm sure a lot of you are now interested. I'm going to ask a lot of questions, because why wouldn't you? Anyway, the contact information is up there for the recruiting operations officer. He's at Barker Hall. His phone number and his email is up there. Thank you. The next one is uh, Arouge. Hazardous breathing conditions. Uh, we uh, also 
get to construct uh, PLAS, uh, which are basically water storage units uh, to ensure that uh, families and houses have like a safe water supply. Um, so, and then uh, after the public health day, we have a water day. So water brigades are um, very like, time consuming and they take a lot of investment. So mostly what we get to do is inspect water systems and learn about how water brigades are carried out. Uh, at the end of every day, we have like a reflection and a discussion where we learn about um, the health problems that uh, certain communities face, uh, the health systems of different countries, uh, and ways that we can all sort of come together and make uh, help make the world a little bit better. So, why did I uh, choose Global Brigades? I joined as a freshman, and I did it because my friends did it too. Uh, I did not have an abundance of initiative uh, as a freshman. I was, you know, straight out of high school. You're still kind of a kid. Um, so uh, I will admit I did join because uh, one of my amazing friends, who's actually here tonight, uh, pushed me to join with her. Uh, and it was definitely one of the best decisions of my life. That was the first trip I had ever taken out of the country without my family. Uh, so it was a great, like, confidence booster. I was like, yeah, I can do this on my own. And that was, you know, a pretty exciting thing to discover. Uh, so after that first trip my freshman year, I got involved with the e-board, uh, taking on various positions, and uh, really developing my uh, leadership skills and problem-solving skills, because there are like a surprising number of issues that come up when you're trying to help run a student organization. And uh, this year, I recently became the president of Global Brigades. So I get to help coordinate um, the trip that's going to be in this upcoming winter. Uh, the reason. The reason I stayed with Global Brigades is not only because of the personal development opportunities that came, uh, but also because the mission of Global Brigades really spoke to me. I want to be a physician because I want to help people, but as I've sort of grown and become more aware of the world around me, I've learned that the contributing factors to a given problem come from all sorts of different, uh, they have all sorts of different sources. So uh, with Global Brigades, it really feels like there's an organization that is trying to tackle all of the sources that contribute to a more unequal world, a more unjust world. Um, as a physician, I want to work uh, one day to help uh, reduce these inequalities and help people live you know, holistically better lives. Um, and working with Global Brigades has helped me sort of get a chance to like, get started on that. Because those of you who are pre-med know, we have a long road ahead of us. We have these four years of undergrad, and then four more years of medical school, and then residency, and then we're like full, you know, fully realized physicians. Um, and that kind of made it difficult for me to sort of see like other pre-health professions. Like I was always jealous of my pre-nursing friends uh, because they get to go to nursing school pretty quickly, and they get to have hands-on patient experience really quickly. And it feels like they're they're giving to the world sooner than I get to. And I am starting to reach a point in my life where I feel more aware of what I take from the world compared to what I give to it. So working with Global Brigades has really helped me realize that I can give back to the world no matter what stage of life I am. Uh, and that really makes it more bearable when I have to sit through like another three hours of like studying for physics, because for some reason pre-meds have to take physics. Um, and it's just, uh, it's just a really rewarding experience for me. Um, so if any of you are interested in maybe joining Global Brigades for our winter trip this year, uh, or just learning more about how you can be involved, we are having an info session next Thursday uh, from 7 to 8 in JSB 243. I would really love to see some of you all there. Um, I know uh, that it can be frustrating being a student and feeling uh, powerless. But you all generally have a lot more power than you think, and I hope that you find ways to exercise your power to make the world a better place, be it through global brigades or through any other thing that you may like to do. So thank you. Up next, we have Oscar. Hey, gang. My name's Oscar Istis. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. I'm a sophomore here at the University of Kentucky, and I'm a biology major with an entomology minor. Um, and I'm actually not on any kind of pre-professional track, which I think is pretty weird for someone with a biology major. But that has a lot to do with the entomology minor that I'm going to be talking a little bit about today. 
Um, so entomology, for those of you guys that don't know, is the study of insects. Um, which might be a little weird, but that's something I was always interested in as a kid. Um, but as I went through middle school and high school, and even into college, I kind of lost that interest. It was never really something that we talked about in school or that I ever learned about, so it kind of just fell to the back of my mind. Um, until one semester at UK, I needed to find a biology elective to fit into my schedule. Um, so I was scrolling through the course catalog, and I found a biology or an entomology class that fulfilled the requirement and fit my schedule. So I kind of thought, why not? What's the worst that can happen? Um, I was really stressed about it at first because it was going to be really different from all of the biology and chemistry classes that I had been taking up until that point. But that's the exact reason why I ended up loving it. Um, at that point, I had felt pretty bored in a lot of my biology and chemistry classes. I walk into class and it kind of feels like it's the same thing every time. Um, all of the experiments are planned to a T, um, and all the professors know exactly what's going to happen every single time um, anyone does an experiment. But I cannot count the times that I walked into an entomology class and my teacher showed up with an experiment and said, guys, I have no idea how this experiment is going to turn out. It happened so many times, and it was a great change of pace from everything I'd been doing up until that point, and it was so much fun. Um, in particular, I can remember one project that we had to do. Um, it was an insect collection. Um, so our teacher gave us a list of insects that we had to collect over the course of the semester, and that was it. Uh, we had the rest of the semester to find these insects anywhere that we could. We could go to parks, we could go around campus. Um, anywhere that we found an insect, we could catch it. Um, so I found myself between all of my classes just kind of walking around like this, looking for any insect that I didn't have. Um, I'm sure it looked pretty weird, but it was actually a ton of fun. It was a really, really good way for me to learn um, hands-on about the stuff that I was supposed to be studying, uh, and it helped me pay a lot more attention to the world around me, which I think I needed at the time. Um, entomology is also a lot more applicable than a lot of people think. Um, fruit flies, for an example, are an insect model that a lot of experiments are done on, just because they're so easy to use. Um, they reproduce really quickly, um, and people can control their genes pretty easily. Um, so that's a model that a lot of people, no matter what field you're in, might end up doing uh, research on, and having a little bit of entomology background actually helps you know a lot about how to handle those guys a little bit better, and understand their physiology a little bit. Um, I'm even doing research in the chemistry department right now on honeybees, so there's even some crossover there. Um, for those of you guys that are interested in getting involved with entomology a little bit, um, there's some information in your brochure about getting involved, and I definitely know that insects are not everyone's cup of tea, but the moral of the story is to just follow your interests. Even if it's not something that everyone is chasing or everyone is trying to pursue a career in, there's a good chance that there's something out there that aligns with what you're interested in. And you are not going to know about that until you go looking for it. Thank you. Uh, next up, Stephanie's going to talk to you guys a little bit more. Okay, so the next presenter, Lily, isn't here tonight. But we have a really good video highlighting her experience um, talking about surgery on a Sunday. So I'm going to play that for you guys. Hi, my name is Lily. I am from the Westboro, Kentucky. I am a senior here at UK and I am a chemistry major on the biochemistry track. I am so sorry that I'm not able to be there today. Unfortunately, I do have class at this time. But I'm willing to bet that there are a lot of pre-professional students out there, whether you're pre-dent, pre-med, uh, pre-PA, or pre-farm. <clears throat> a big part about being a pre-professional student is finding shadowing opportunities to show that you do have a strong interest in the field and to gain knowledge about the day-to-day -day life of being in that profession. Well, today I would like to talk to you about surgeries on Sundays. Surgeries on Sundays is a nonprofit organization that provides free outpatient surgeries to those in need. 
What's truly spectacular about this program is that <clears throat> all the supplies are donated to them. Um, everyone who is involved in the process uh, donates their time and service to the patients as well. Um, whether that's the physicians, anesthesiologists, coordinators, um, scrub nurses, they all volunteer their Sundays um, to help out with this organization, which is absolutely amazing. I first heard about surgeries on Sundays from my triaging, triaging position at the Salvation Army Clinic here in Lexington. Um, <clears throat> when I first heard about it, I really didn't think I would be able to really see the surgeries. I thought that I would be in the back of the room, um, not really being able to see, just kind of listening to the process, um, but that was definitely not the case when I got there. Um, I didn't think that I would be standing directly behind the surgeon the whole time. Um, of course, it does depend on the type of surgery you're seeing, um, but for all the surgeries that I've been able to shadow, I was standing right on top of the physician. I thought that I was way too close to him, um, but the more that I thought of that, uh, the more he told me that I needed to get closer. So I was basically breathing down his neck. Um, and he didn't mind because he wanted to make sure that I saw everything, which I thought was absolutely amazing. Um, I also didn't think that a lot of the physicians would talk to me because they were just so in tune in the surgery. Um, however, that was also not the case. Uh, the surgeons asked a lot about my life, what I'm doing as an undergraduate, why I want to become a physician, which is uh, very amazing to me, and they were very open to questions. Um, if you're shadowing, one of my biggest advice to you is to definitely talk to the physician. Come prepared with some questions to ask them. Um, because that's what I always do, because that's how I feel like I gain the most insight of what, it's truly, what it truly is like to be a physician. Um, I loved uh, the one-on-one -on -one connection that I felt that I had with the surgeon. I asked him about why he became a physician, why he would donate his time, uh, his whole Sunday for surgeries on Sundays. Um, and it's truly amazing to hear the different stories, the different reasonings that each surgeon has. Another great thing about surgeries on Sundays for undergraduates is that I thought I would only be able to shadow one surgery. Um, the past few times that I've been able to uh, work with this organization, I've been able to see about two to three surgeries in one day, which is absolutely amazing to me. Um, <clears throat> there are about six surgeons uh, for the day and a lot of scrub nurses and being able to talk to every single one of them is very impactful. <clears throat> I love being able to see the connections that they make with the patients as well. You see that surgeon-patient interaction, um, you get to see how meaningful it is to the patient knowing that the surgeon is there talking to them. Um, and reassuring that the surgery is going, going to be fine. I love talking to the patients and just knowing how much this organization has changed their lives. It's truly amazing. Um, I really uh, suggest for you that if you do shadow, make sure that you are talking to the physicians. It uh, truly will change how your shadowing experience will be, whether uh, rather than just standing there and just watching the whole time, be proactive, ask questions, whether that's about physician life or about the surgery happening now, um, or just even questions about how the physician got to where they are now. Um, it's truly amazing to hear the different uh, perspectives of everyone's stories. Um, if you would like more information about this organization, there is their website in the pamphlet that you have. Um, you can easily volunteer on the website. There is an area for undergraduate students to volunteer as um, an observer uh, for the day. That way uh, they email you back um, and tell you which day uh, you can come in to shadow. Um, it does take a little bit of time to hear back from the organization. Uh, sometimes, depending on when you submitted your uh, request form, um, it can take two to three weeks, or it can take two to three months. I waited for both periods, but it's definitely worth it. Go ahead and submit a form saying you want to shadow, um, and just wait for that email to come in. 
Um, if you have any more questions about this organization, feel free to email me at lily.do at uky.edu. And I really hope that everyone takes the opportunity to learn a little bit more about this organization. Uh, they have a Facebook page where they talk about all the different fundraising um, that they do to uh, purchase all the supplies that they use for surgeries. Um, I would definitely check that out as well. And I hope you enjoy um, learning more about surgeries on Sundays. Okay, so the next presenter was supposed to be Riley, but he's unable to be here tonight also. Um, so he was going to talk about his experience as a STEM cat mentor. Um, so if you want more information about that or want to hear other mentors' experience about it, feel free to come talk to us after this, and we'll share our experience with you guys. But on behalf of the STEM cats program, I'd like to thank you all for coming today and listening to our mentors talk about their experiences in the STEM field, and I hope they inspire you to join any club or organizations that I talked about. So thank you so much again for coming tonight. Also, guys, if you will look on the bottom of your plates, if you have a sticker, we have t-shirts up here. So if you have a sticker on the bottom of your plate, come on down and we will give you a t-shirt.